It's a beautiful Friday, very good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you're watching us from. Welcome to yet another episode of Akfim Talks, your host Felix Kafuma, and today we are discussing cryptocurrency and political finance in Uganda. And like it's always my practice, uh, this is why I invite everybody out there to join us um, for today's um, discussions. You can be part of this conversation on all our social media platforms. We are live on Twitter at AkfimUG. We are live on, uh, on on Facebook and also live on YouTube, AkfimUG. Yeah, you just log in and get there and then we get the conversation started. And with me, um, I'll be introducing two guests who will be um, helping us make sense of cryptocurrency and political financing in Uganda. Uh, but just to to uh, make sense of this conversation, where are we coming from, is um, and, and why is um, is uh, the political finance watchdog that probably brings you this show at Film Talks every Friday between eleven to midday is now uh, putting into spotlight this conversation. It's because um, we've observed that uh, I think um, our our media team uh, last week um, came across a shop that was trading in dig cryptocurrencies commonly known as cryptocurrencies in Uganda's capital Kampala and uh, uh, that shop is uh, is along uh, uh, I think that's Ginger Road or Kampala Road and, and it, it opened its outlet and before not before long we should be able to see more of other outlets opening up across the country uh, and you might be uh, also aware that uh, not so long ago, the conversation around uh, cryptocurrencies has been um, ongoing, uh, especially for the past four years, and gaining traction in Uganda. And we can now comfortably say that um, looks like um, um, the first official uh, shop to trade in cryptocurrency has now opened in Uganda. And there are now more than 1,000 cryptocurrencies in the market which is mainly dominated by the Bitcoin, according to the trading view of 2018. Um, and their use is increasing in all forms and including uh, political activities such as election campaign financing. Um, the digital currency shop in Uganda is so far currently uh, only a trading in Bitcoin, Chainlink and Tether, um, among others. Um, but world over, this conversation on, 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 on cryptocurrency uh, um, that seems to be gaining traction and many countries are struggling on how to deal with it. Um, uh, and the undecided on whether uh, to consider cryptocurrencies in the same category as other conventional currencies, like the way you see, you look at the dollar, pound, yuan, or, um, or, um, or the euro, and whether it should be treated as an asset, um, as an asset, um, and it's also unclear on what the exchange rate in relation to other international currencies should be. So um, there is an ongoing conversation and, 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 and debate um, on how to deal with cryptocurrency. Uh, but in today's episode uh, of Actum Talks, we focus on the topic of cryptocurrency and how it relates with political financing as developments continue to unravel. And with me, um, I have two gentlemen, like I promised to introduce them. I have Geoffrey Ekongot, who is a creative professional, conception, conceptual thinker, and a tech savvy expert, quite knowledgeable on the subject of cryptocurrency. He has also served uh, in different capacities as the talent consultant for a global music television channel, MTV Base. Um, also, at Sav, I don't know that whether Geoffrey is still the current chairperson um, for the Electoral Commission of uh, of Uganda Musicians Association. Um, ah, at some point, you were very uh, active in that area, but he's also the current chairman of Donors Center for Home. Donors Center Home for uh, Autism. You are most welcome, um, Geoffrey. Uh, thank you, Felix. Yeah, it's good to be here. Great. Um, our other uh, panelist is uh, uh, Henry Moguzi, who is a regular on this uh, on this show. Uh, Henry Moguzi is a political finance expert. He's also an anti-corruption uh, activist, a researcher, as well as a political scientist. He's the current executive director of Alliance for Finance Monitoring. Henry, you're most welcome to the show. 
Thank you, Felix. Thank you for having me. And uh, to our view, viewers, wherever you are, good morning, good afternoon, good night. Okay. Uh, like I said, um, we are proud to be among the first institutions, our organizations, having this conversation around uh, cryptocurrency as it gains traction. Um, and uh, for starters, uh, we need to split the atom. And I'm going to bring um, Jeff. Jeff, I'm going to um, task you to explain what cryptocurrency is, how does it work, how does it differ from other currencies, how is it regulated, is there another banking system for cryptocurrency that is uh, different from the, from the known financial systems. Just help someone out there who is interfacing with this conversation for the first time. Uh, thank you very much, Felix. Uh, I'm really an enthusiast on uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, my explanation will be non-technical. But from um, a non-technical point of view, uh, let's look at traditional currencies first, then uh, we can juxtapose that with uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, traditional currencies, uh, also known as a fiat currency, uh, can are regulated by uh, central banks worldwide. Uh, in our case in Uganda, we are, they are regulated by the central bank. It means that uh, all transactions are in directly or indirectly monitored by uh, the central bank. Let's say uh, on a day-to-day, -day, if you issue a check, the check uh, will go through your bank, and then uh, BOU will, will, will have a say in what happens to it, and then finally to the recipient or the beneficiary of the check. So in a way, uh, BOU, the central bank, uh, uh, is is acting as a middleman to 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 ensure that all transactions are, are monitored and they are legit. So wh wh where does cryptocurrency come in? Cryptocurrency falls in the category of uh, decentralized finance. The idea behind uh, cryptocurrency is to get rid of the middleman. Uh, people who started cryptocurrencies felt like there's no need for uh, uh, a central bank because uh, it, it creates uh, uh, costs. Uh, two, it makes uh, transactions slow uh, because uh, third parties have to uh, be involved. Of course, there were there are other concerns uh, to do with also uh, safety. Uh, some people feel like uh, crypto cryptocurrencies are much safer because uh, cryptocurrencies are built on the concept of uh, uh, blockchain. Uh, so the blockchain is essentially uh, uh, a distributed ledger. So what does that mean? Um, if we say the central bank is like our central ledger, where all transactions are, are documented, uh, in the context of a blockchain, it's a system where uh, there are millions of copies of this ledger, and there's an automated way of keeping uh, a record of all transactions without uh, a central point where these transactions are recorded or controlled. So it means that no third party can uh, can come and uh, influence directly what happens when two people are trying to transact or two parties are trying to transact. So cryptocurrencies essentially were created to, uh, to in a way, to represent freedom uh, of uh, choice in transacting so that you don't have to feel like a third party has to control how you spend your money and who you deal with. Of course, there are regulatory concerns such as uh, money laundering and then governments want to have a say in the day-to-day -day affairs of their citizens. Uh, but uh, the people who started uh, these concepts were thinking way beyond things like that. Of course, there have been concerns and on, 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 on such issues. But in basic terms, uh, cryptocurrency is just uh, uh, a way, a distributed way of uh, moving uh money it's a, a digital cash with a, a non-centralized uh way of uh monitoring the transactions wow um, thank, thank you for it i think i think that should be covered the, the, the basics yes yes you you do cover the basics and, and and you make a case that okay uh it's a decentralized way of moving cash um so in this case you remove the third party and 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 you, you deal directly with uh with the other actors minus the third party 
it also then it is going to raise but you said it is a it's a much safer way and 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 so you you make arguments pros for why digital currency should be uh considered um then my other question is because you said it's built on it's, it's built on the blockchain how does this then differ from i think you've heard of, of what they call pyramid schemes oh yes i have how, heard about how pyramid does schemes. now how does the crypto differ from the pyramid schemes uh, that's a very good question now there has been uh, when cryptocurrencies were started uh, they they are, at first it was more peer to peer like from individuals to individuals then they felt there was a need to create uh, what they call crypto exchanges crypto exchanges facilitate uh, the details in these transactions for example, if I have uh, Uganda shillings and I want to acquire a certain amount of uh, uh, crypto Bitcoin or a certain cryptocurrency, there has to be the, the exchange process. So somebody has to be willing to take my Uganda shilling uh, in exchange for the Bitcoin. So uh, like, a reg like the way you would go to a regular Forex Bureau, some that's the, the Forex Bureau becomes a third party who is willing to uh, hang on to your uh, your dollars or your Uganda shilling in exchange. So the exchanges were created. And these exchanges were supposed to uh, uh, help facilitate that process. But because uh, cryptocurrencies are still, are still at, at the early stage, um, scammers started creating fake exchanges or fake platforms that see, uh, pretend to offer these services. And that's how they gave birth to uh, uh, these uh, pyramid schemes. Uh, they started uh, uh, creating uh, these pyramid schemes in, in the guise that they're giving you an opportunity to, to cash in. How are you cashing in? Uh, for example, there are people who are genuinely uh, uh, making a, a ton of money from facilitating these exchanges. Um, let's, let me uh, compare it to mobile money. When you when you send uh, mobile money to a third party, you go to a mobile money point. The mobile money point is the one that creates has to uh, fork the float, the float to temporarily make sure there's money that you can take, and there's a, uh, there's money that can be received on the other end to to be able to be to convert it to cash. So the, these exchanges were meant to do this. So in the context of cryptocurrencies, there's what they call, for example, liquidity pools. People who bring these floats to facilitate these transactions. So people, uh, scammers, uh, took advantage of ignorance of all these technical details around these transactions and started pretending to offer people an opportunity to cash in on this whole thing. But because people don't want to take the time to understand the technical details, once they hear that, oh, you, you, uh, you invest uh, X amount of money and somehow a third party will help you to uh, take care of the technical details and you make money somehow. And then they, they came in and started creating all these fake exchanges. I remember Bank of Uganda uh, issued a, a warning around one coin. One coin one was one of those fake ones. <laughs> and most of these ones are usually early because these were created by real technical people who understand how the legitimate uh, cryptocurrency world works. So they create parallel systems that sort of mimic the other ones. But they tweak a few things in the logic and then uh, the non-technical people miss these details. Uh, people who are not interested in uh, understanding the, the technical details usually miss these details and they get scammed. And of course, the pyramid schemes are typical that they, they require you to uh, also recruit other users and uh, somehow you also take a cut off the other user. So it's it's an issue of uh, greed and uh, uh, unscrupulous people taking advantage of legitimate uh, uh, crypto technologies that are actually are very useful. Wow. Um, I'm <laughs> you are taking me to school. I'm understanding this whole concept. Of, you know, I'm going to bring you in at some point, but let me first run with... Uh, with Geoffrey, because we, we must first demystify this concept of cryptocurrency. Now, how is it regulated? Because, okay, you've removed, in the conventional way, you've, uh, you have Bank of Uganda, for example, you have a central bank that does uh, play the third party, which is kind of like 
the regulator, when it comes to cryptocurrencies, who regulates? How is this regulated? And and and, and does that also explain why many countries are struggling to regulate it because it, it can't be regulated? How do you how do you regulate uh, cryptocurrencies realistically? Uh, technically, cryptocurrencies are supposed to be automatic. That's the concept of the distributed ledger. It's supposed to be software that uh, is written around certain principles that, but for example, if this happens, then that happens. If this, so the rules are automatic and there's supposed to be no third party directly manipulating this. However, uh, somebody has to build this software and somebody has to make sure this software keeps working. So that's where the exchanges come in. And uh, these exchanges are the ones who are building the software and they, they, they take uh, a small cut in fees for access for using these platforms. Now, where does the regulation come in? Uh, so on, on a global scale, the top exchanges uh, don't have direct regulation, but in, in specific countries, where they, they operate, those countries have dictated that they must operate a certain way. And uh, there's some form of regulation. For example, Binance is one of the biggest uh, cryptocurrency exchanges. And uh, it was started by uh, a guy from Singapore. Uh, it's operating worldwide, has not been operating here in Uganda. and But in the US, the US government insisted that they must create uh, a different copy of their exchange, uh, a copy that goes by the rules of uh, the US regulators. So where they have some kind of oversight, how they can control what, what goes on. So in the US, Binance is regulated by the US government. Uh, but in some countries, it's just operating freely. Like here, it was operating freely until recently when Bank of Uganda uh, issued uh, that warning uh, against all uh, uh, fin financial technology companies uh, to desist from dealing with uh, uh, crypto platforms. However, uh, the, 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 the concept of regulation is, uh, is, is not in, in the standard form as we understand it. It's more um, uh, because cryptocurrencies are really automatic in the way they operate. When they, uh, they, they, when they fluctuate, it's based on uh, the, 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 the market, uh, uh, what's happening in the market. So regulation uh, is a, a new concept that governments are beginning to take on. Uh, for example, in the US, um, they were required, the basic requirement was that they must register a new company in the US uh, that, that, that is monitored by the US government. But the government had not specifically uh, put in place very clear policies on, on how they operate. Actually, the US Congress has been having uh, engagements with uh, the top crypto uh, fraternity uh, to, to understand how they can position to, to play a, a role in, in the crypto space. And these uh, conversations are ongoing so that these conversations can form the foundation for uh, uh, some kind of regulation in the future. Uh, in our own space here, Bank of Uganda has been uh, their position in the first in the beginning was uh, that they, they didn't really understand what was happening in the space, so they kept some kind of arm's length uh, uh, attitude. And then eventually, when they started um, uh, taking some kind of uh, position, it was more uh, directly distancing themselves from these. Uh, uh, crypto platforms and uh, insisting that uh, the public doesn't uh, engage with them. However, there has been a, 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 a change of uh, direction. Just recently, the Bank of Uganda created uh, what they call a, a regulatory sandbox. A regulatory sandbox is, is a, a safe space where they have invited uh, financial technology companies to come and test uh, or, or uh, pilot their ideas around uh, crypto. They want to have this safe space where they can uh, understand how these things work and the implications before they roll them out uh, to the public. So 
uh, regulation around uh, cryptocurrencies is uh, is in its early stages because the regulators don't really know how exactly to regulate them. So it's it's a, a developing space. Wow! Well, uh, thank you so much. You're still watching Action Talks. We're having a very interesting conversation about cryptocurrency and and how it relates with political financing. And this is why I bring in um, Henry Henry Muguzi. Um, and I was reading a report uh, by Becca McKenzie on blockchain and cryptocurrency in Africa. Interestingly, and we are still running, discussing the issue of regulation here. Um, uh, and uh, interestingly, countries the, in the Maghreb, countries like Morocco, Algeria, Libya, then Zambia down here, and then Namibia, Zimbabwe, uh, Swaziland, for them, they have just banned cryptocurrency. But when you come to our region, um, where you have um, 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 uh, countries like uh, Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, Botswana, Madagascar, uh, Ghana, Nigeria, and uh, Cameroon, DRC, Rwanda, for them, they have no stance. They have not banned it, neither are they necessarily promoting it. It's a gray area. When you come to countries like uh, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Swaziland, Lesotho, and South Africa, these ones are having progressive discussions towards embracing uh, uh, cryptocurrency and even uh, actually some of them have gone ahead to even provide, put in place what they call, what you call the regulatory sandbox. Um, so uh, they are a bit progressive in that direction. But, but let me come to you uh, in, with, in view of that. Uh, first of all, how practical is it to, to regulate cryptocurrency Let's look at the case of Uganda. Um, are, are they even, is cryptocurrency legal? Is it legal? This is a question I'm asking myself. And, and I think even at some point, I'll come back to you, Geoffrey, but you can also attempt this, Henry. Who owns cryptocurrency? Because Geoffrey has just said some individuals come together, put in place a system. But then who owns it? Where does the back stop? Thank you, Felix. I think. Uh... In my presentation, I'm going to try because we have uh, a, a subject of discussion that says cryptocurrency and, and political finance in Uganda. I'm going to, to also make an effort to move cryptocurrency from its current realm to the realm of political finance so that we can be able to draw the, the, the lines. Of course, Geoffrey has uh, articulated very well, but I'll just point out one or two or three things. Number one, Crypto is a currency that was created in defiance. The reason I call it defiance is that you have a group of, of, of men and women who got tired of being regulated by central banks and said, look, how do we go around the system? So they, provide, they, they came up with the crypto. Which is why he ably uh, pointed out the fact that it is decentralized. Decentralized meaning that uh, there is no centralized, centralized mechanism that regulates it. The other thing maybe he fell short of, of pointing out is the issue of anonymity. That most of these uh, crypto cryptocurrencies are anonymous. And because they are anonymous and enveloped in defiance, then they, they become a currency that everybody wants to use. Now, crypto, by its very nature, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is difficult to track. I know there are some that have a degree of transparency, but most of the cryptocurrencies are not, uh, are not easy to track, which is why they are growing in popularity. Now, in many countries that are not regulated, I was reading that many of the of the developed uh, north the americas and canada but also europe <laughs> do not have yet regulations to regulate cryptocurrency because many of them do not understand them you see cryptocurrency is a phenomena you, you, you nobody clearly knows how this phenomena operates they're just trying to understand it and uh, I will tell you that the originators of cryptocurrency did not do so um, because they wanted the uh, uh, transparency or, or, or sunlight. They did so because they wanted to continue hiding, concealing their transactions. Now, 
that is where the crux of the matter is when it comes to political financing. Because in many countries, you know, before you go there, but you know, cryptocurrency, the other advantage it has is that it knows no borders. It easily moves from one country to the next without being detected. It is so stealth. It cannot be detected. It's such a lethal weapon that every person would want to use. Now, there is the problem because when you look around, uh, we know that money is, is an issue uh, when it comes to politics. We know that for you to have uh, hygiene in your democracy, it's important that you regulate money, money that finances political parties, but also money that finances election campaigns. We know that in a number of countries, close to 70% of countries that have put in place robust political finance regulatory framework. They have banned uh, money from foreign sources. And the reason they ban this is because you don't want a situation where there are foreign entities that have bankrolled the political parties in your country or bankrolled the candidates, in which case they are more, the candidates and the political parties become more loyal to the foreigner than they are to the uh, the system of the country. But because crypto is this phenomena that defies borders, it has become very popular within political finance, the realm of political finance, because it is money is removed. You recall in the recent elections, there were questions about how does the opposition political party no access its money many of the government uh, intelligence officers <coughs> acting on the basis of half-baked information concluded easily that it was us for society organizations that were being used as conduits for no money but now we know because cryptocurrencies have been here for such a long time and I would not be surprised if that was one of the channels that was used to, to, to stealthily uh, get money into the country. And so um, uh, the, 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 the thing is that uh, when it comes to a country like Uganda and many African countries where we have not even paid attention to crypto because merely putting in a place what you call a sandbox, you see, you are trying to deal with an entity that does not want to be regulated. So who tells you the... the <laughs> Even when they come, they will come with the open open hands. They're going to hide a number of things. Because what makes crypto crypto is, is that concealment. And you want them now to operate in open space like you, other currencies do. And you think they're going to say yes. They're going to come up with other means, mechanisms. So a country like Uganda, not only do we not have a law that regulates campaign finance, we don't even have any framework in place to regulate cryptocurrencies. And you can, you've seen, like you introduced, a shop has been opened on Kampala Road. Now, when that shop gets to be opened, there it tells you by the time it opens, the, the cryptocurrency as a concept has now been deeply entrenched in the country. And a lot of people have now uh, uh, gotten to, to, to use it. And we don't know how that this is going to mean to our, to our politics because we have a law that stops uh, political parties from accessing money from foreign sources. But we, when it comes to crypto, because the crypto money won't be kept on any bank account. Therefore, if you're waiting to track it from uh, uh, Bank of Uganda or the Financial Intelligence Authority, you will not find it. And when you ask our good friends at the Financial Intelligence Authority, do you have any mechanisms in place to track transactions on crypto? I'm not sure they will say, yes, we have something. Crypto is, is, is crypto as a currency uh, has not only been uh, embraced by uh, uh, people who are, are trying to fund politics, but I think also terrorists, but we will, we'll get there. Now, so, it's, I, I think it's important to understand this cryptocurrency that as a currency, you can, first of all, you cannot touch it. You cannot feel it. It's a currency in your head. It is utopian. You see? So how are you going to track it? 
So I, I want to, to, to end by saying that we have really a challenge on our hands. And I don't think the regulatory framework, the lawmakers and the institutional framework, the institutions we have in place, will be able to handle what is about to come when it comes to crypto, especially in a country where corruption is the norm, especially syndicated corruption. Thank you, Felix. Thank you so much. Um, well, let's go for a break. And by when we return, um, we will continue with this conversation. First of all, uh, to look at um, what opportunities does cryptocurrency present, apart from the fears we have.